I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Matt Botine, the co-founder and managing partner of Gallatin Point Capital, a billion and a half dollar private investment company he founded after departing from BlackRock, where he had served as the chief investment officer and co-head of the firm's $160 billion alternatives business. Before sitting atop that lofty perch, Matt formed a bank after the financial crisis, was a managing director at hedge fund Highfields Capital, and a private equity principal at Blackstone. Our conversation starts with Matt's early career experience, touching on differences in public and private investing, and forming new financial companies after periods of crisis. We then turn to his reconnection with Larry Fink, who in short order tapped Matt to run BlackRock's giant alternatives business. We discuss his unusually graceful exit from BlackRock, flexible investment approach at Gallatin Point, and perspective from meeting a wide array of large pools of institutional capital globally. We finish with his take on the opportunities and challenges for private equity, headwinds for hedge funds, and real assets for his personal portfolio. Back when Matt and I were in school together, he was renowned for taking an occasional snooze in class, getting cold called by the professor, and waking up only to offer the most plugged in and articulate answer anyone could have imagined. I suspected tapping into his brilliant mind would provide lots of food for thought, and he certainly didn't disappoint. Please enjoy my conversation with Matt Botine. Matt, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Why don't we start with your path? How did you first start out in your career? I think it was a fairly accidental path. My first couple of summers in college, I worked, and I worked in cable TV for one of the cable TV barons, a guy named Bill Bresnan. And hanging out with Bill, I fell in love with the media business and thought, I'm going to be a media baron too. And went to work in strategy and went to Walt Disney and then Boston Consulting Group before going to business school. So I was clearly on a media telecom path. And did that sustain itself through those early work experiences? I loved it in the early experiences. I worked on glamorous projects for Ninex, trying to figure out what it costs Ninex to generate a bill. That's where I learned the difference (laughs) between the promise of consulting and the reality. And then went off to business school. and, And while I was there, thought more about what I wanted to do and the angle from which I wanted to approach things and became more interested in being an investor. There was the small matter of I had never been an investor before going to business school. Where did that interest come from? As a kid, I had been interested in investing in stocks. And I read a bunch of business books by the writers of our time, so barbarians and the like. But it was just an interest, not something I had acted on. Uh, in terms of being a professional investor. So I did my first formal finance work experience the summer between first and second years in business school and worked at Goldman in the mergers department. And then I thought, well, now I'm ready. (laughs) (laughs) What was that summer like? Summer was fun. We had a bunch of great classmates who were there and the people who were in the department were great and they learned a lot and had a good time. But not investment banking. I didn't want to be an investment banker. I was more interested in the life after the deal than the, just figuring out the deal. And so I thought, well, I should go and do private equity. And then uh, realized in business school that there were a lot of our classmates had actually done private equity. And as there was a queue uh, to get those jobs, I, I, I dawned on me I was not at the front of the queue. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you do with that? <laughs> well, I went through the process, but it, it was very humbling to you know, sit around you know, Ben Jenkins and Harry Wilson and a bunch of our classmates who've gone on to great things who had real meaningful experience in private equity. I was very lucky in sort of a unifying theme of careers, I think. I put the letters into all the private equity firms and did 
got very few responses, but had one entree uh, through a friend uh, to uh, Lazard, which was putting together a, a private equity firm. They had been in and out of private equity over the years. They had brought over two really good guys to start a private equity business, David Tanner from Warburg, Tom Lynch from Blackstone. And so they, they brought them in, they launched this effort. Mark Bodnick joined from Blackstone to work with them. And I was very excited about it. And they were willing to take a flyer on somebody who had no private equity experience and with a lot of excitement and no experience. <laughs> I showed up to Lazard. A couple of weeks before I joined, before I was set to start, Mark Bodnick called and said, I'm leaving to go and help found Silver Lake. And I also learned there were some issues related to Lazard's investment business, particularly the real estate business, that were likely to delay somehow the fundraise. Uh, but showed up to work and it was a great opportunity. Because even though we had fundraising uncertainty, there was a little capital and there was a great team. David and Tom are terrific people, became good friends, were great mentors. And so I, with no experience, but good teachers, started working in private equity and figuring out what it was actually about. And uh, because we were small and, and thin and young, they let me go off and do things that I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to be able to do. What's your favorite story? Oh, gosh. There were a bunch, but I, I was still in media mode at this point. So I do remember going down to the Florida Panhandle to look at buying the uh, St. Joe Telephone Company. And most people don't know there are still, you know, there's Verizon, there's AT&T. There are like 1,100 other phone companies in the United States. One of them was the St. Joe Telephone Company. So I remember wandering around the Florida panhandle with the guys from Bresnan Communications who had sold the cable business and I'd brought in to be our partner looking at the phone business. Maybe the highlight was going to the Opasco conference, which you probably have never heard of. It's the organization for the promotion and advancement of small telephone organizations. <laughs> I think it's the organization for the promotion and advancement of uh, biannual retreats yeah. <laughs> for family-owned businesses. It was in Hawaii. That was fun. My wife still teases me. My luggage was lost, and I came back with my interim clothing I had bought there, which was match-set Hawaiian outfits. Excellent. And, yeah. yeah. They did disappear. <laughs> Eventually. I think they were lost in our last move. But it was a great experience, except for the part of it becoming clear that the fund was not getting raised anytime soon. But then again, back to luck, Mark Bodnick, kept in mind where I was. And when things looked like they might not go anywhere, called over to Blackstone, where he'd come from, and they were looking for another associate. And you know, Blackstone would never have interviewed me, coming right out of business school, having no private equity experience. But between Mark's endorsement and the fact that I had some nominal level of private equity experience, they took a gamble and gave me a job. And I moved over to Blackstone, and it was, it was like a, an unbelievable opportunity. Very intimidating, the, you know, the early days. I shared an office with Harry Wilson, who is a brilliant and unmistakably hardworking guy. So if you want to be intimidated in your first day at a major private equity firm, share an office with Harry Wilson. <laughs> so what was it like going from this open landscape, go down to the Florida panhandle, do whatever you want to regimented, structured, highly disciplined environment like Blackstone? It was really intimidating. Everyone there just knew so much. They threw me into a deal. And one of the great things, that Michael Che, who's now the CFO of Blackstone, was my first deal boss. And he knew how little I, I knew. So he, even though I was the associate on the deal, gave me the responsibility for doing the financial model. And I looked at like the other financial models that third and fourth year analysts had put together and they're like 50 pages long and really sophisticated. And I had done strategy consultant Excel, which is a different language. So he gave me that to do. And then we progressed the deal and we had to organize the financing. So I had to negotiate the financing documents and the purchase and sale agreement and the shareholders agreement. And this was, you know, muscle memory for everybody else. And it was all new for me, but there were great 
people around me having, in this case, having Harry as an office mate, in addition to being a friend, was unbelievably helpful because I had someone to ask questions of. Michael was great. I could ask questions of him. And so I, I learned a lot in a short period of time from some really smart people. And then I'd say to the credit of the firm, it's a big market leading firm, but it hasn't lost being entrepreneurial. So even though it had this great market presence and mega fund, mega fund back then was $3.6 billion, but they still were actually really encouraging of going off and discovering new territories, which was like the next bit of luck because I was one of many media and telecom people at Blackstone at the time. And it was clear that was a crowded space. And there are other areas that were really uncrowded. And one day, one of those presented when Jack Byrne, who was like this legendary chairman and CEO, founder of White Mountains Insurance, called Steve Schwarzman with a deal opportunity. And I, th- I think Steve must have looked like way down a list to see who had financial services experience. And there was very little at the time. And so he ended up calling me and saying, why don't you go work on this? And it was a first or second, maybe second year associate at Blackstone. Next thing I know, I'm in Hanover, New Hampshire, on a deal team of one, meeting with Jack Byrne and hearing about what he was planning on buying and how he would manage it. And by the end of that project, I was what would pass as a financial services person in a firm that had not, at that point, specialized at all in that area. And so they gave me a a huge amount of latitude to go off and look at that deal and look at others, and then supported it with some analyst support, but also partner support. Because as an associate, you really shouldn't in, in, be <laughs> off working on deals, and, and that wasn't lost on them. But it was a really miraculous kind of thing because there were people there, mentored figures there of a quality that they didn't try to stifle or control, but wanted to support. So guys like David Blitzer and Brett Perlman, who David's still there running the tech ops business, and and Brett went on to form a private equity firm with Bono. But they both just stepped in in a way that I had support and I had sponsorship without being told, don't you dare be creative. And so it was really terrific. And I developed a lot more knowledge about insurance and other forms of financial services. And then we got to 2003. I'd gotten married. She had gone to medical school while we were in New York. So she was graduating from medical school. And we started to think about where are we going to raise a family? And I think that the the data would be pretty clear that you end up raising a family where your wife is from, (laughs) if if there's any question. Uh, And my wife is from Boston. So I called uh, Andre Perold. And, and, and said, Andre, I think I may need to move to Boston. Do you have any ideas for jobs? And Andre was amazing and put me in touch with a couple of people at the Harvard Endowment, with John Jacobson and Richard Grubman from Highfields. And I went and saw them, and John and Richard were awesome. They understood my background, that, that I was not a, an experienced hedge fund investor, that I came from a private background, that I had spent a lot of time in financial services. They didn't have anyone who had spent a lot of time in financial services, and that my move was contingent on Sue matching in a residency process. And they, they were great. They said, listen, tell you what, if she matches in Boston, you have a job. If she doesn't match in Boston, no one will know that we ever had this conversation. And uh, Sue's a great candidate, so she matched. How did you think about the transition private equity to say public equity or hedge funds in this case? I think incorrectly. I thought investing is investing. You do your work, you understand industry dynamics, you understand competitive positioning, you understand the financial structure and outlook for the company, you value it. And whether it is buying a company in whole or in part through the market shouldn't really make any difference. And that was very much the Highfields mantra, where value investors who are deeply engaged I learned something important about myself in the process because I probably always thought of myself as more cerebral, less 
emotional, less relationship driven. And when I got to Highfields and started investing there, pretty quickly I realized that I actually missed the level of engagement that I had with portfolio companies or prospective investment management teams in private equity. I didn't realize how much I needed it or enjoyed it until it was removed a level to the nature of those relationships in a public context. And Highfield is very forward on relationships relative to a lot of public securities firms. But there's still Reg FD and there are rules and there are barriers. And so fairly quickly I realized I actually miss sitting down with management and talking about things and thinking through what are our allocation priorities for capital, for time, for people. So I missed that. On the other hand, it was a great environment in which to learn. And so I just dove into it and rounded out what I knew about the PNC insurance business and uh, a little bit about the mortgage business with life insurance and banking and other forms of specialty finance, mostly public. And then there was still an opportunity there because this was still in the era of open side pockets to dabble in uh, private equity investing. So when the hurricanes all took place in 2004 and 2005, I was able to take some time and capital and we set up a sidecar reinsurance vehicle with XL Capital. And when we got forward into the mortgage crisis, I was able to take some time and some capital and working with BlackRock, set up a mortgage business to focus on the same basic approach. If following a hurricane, you start to reinsure, then following a mortgage crisis, you start a mortgage company. And so we set up a business to buy, uh, service, refinance, distressed residential mortgages. And so I really enjoyed that part of the job, but it was clear to me by that point, uh, six years in, that I enjoyed that part of the job a lot more than I enjoyed the public securities part of the job and that there were other people who enjoyed the public securities part of the job way more than I did. So then I thought, well, I'm going to go and uh, I had a great idea. I'm going to leave and I'm going to start a bank. Post-crisis. Post-crisis, because what does the world need more than a nice, clean bank? And at the time, deposits were really, really cheap, Fed had cut rates and uh, variable rate mortgages were very, very high rate. There was a lot of spread between the two. So I thought, this is really simple. I'm going to start a bank focused on high net worth depositors because you can get big, chunky deposits, take the money and lend it out at high spreads to really good people. And that'll be great. So I called an old mentor of mine who was a professor in college and in business school, Bob Glauber. I said, Bob, I have this idea, just like we did, you know, the mortgage business, we're going to go, let's go do a bank. And he said, that's great. And he'd been on the board of the Boston Fed and he'd been undersecretary of treasury and he'd run FINRA. So he had a lot of credibility with regulators. And we went to see the Fed and without like, you know, betraying confidences, it was clear to me that it was not the direction of travel in the Federal Reserve System at the time to give new banking charters to anyone. But if they were going to give them to anyone, it wasn't going to be somebody whose pedigree said hedge fund private equity. <laughs> <laughs> so even with Bob, it didn't matter. No, no, no. So, but you know, it actually ended up engineering a, a little deal where we bought a majority interest on behalf of a group of investors in a bank, and I met a, a an actually qualified bank management team, uh, particularly a, a great CEO, and so engineered a deal for that great CEO and management team to go into the bank and investors to take an interest. But it it was becoming clear as this was proceeding that I was not going to be the CEO of the bank. And actually the system was right. I I shouldn't have been. And along the way, Larry Fink called. So BlackRock had been my partner at Highfields in the creation of this mortgage business called PennyMac. And Larry said something like, what are you doing messing around with a little bank? You should figure out something much bigger to do here. We can do much bigger things here. And he was right. So as Larry usually is, 
<laughs> so I went to BlackRock initially thinking we'll start a kind of a special sits business that'll leverage the deal flow that comes across BlackRock. BlackRock at the time was a really big firm. It was a little over a trillion dollars in assets under management and a couple thousand people. Yeah. I think it's now six and a half trillion and 15,000 people. I just settled in there when Larry said, you know, we should actually have a real alternatives effort. Do you want to run that? And so I said, you know, great. And what did that mean? Unclear at the time, but BlackRock had been more recently acquisitive and had gone from being a you know, relatively pure fixed income asset manager. And then with the acquisitions of State Street Research and Management, Merrill Lynch Investment Managers, and ultimately BGI, along with Quellos, had accumulated unintentionally a number of alternative capabilities. With those acquisitions had come a couple of real estate businesses, a hedge fund of funds business, a private equity fund of funds business, and a number of hedge funds. And so the initial job was pull that together because most of those continue to live in some uh, other historically associated part of the firm. So pull it together and think about what are the things that we are doing that we should be doing and what are the things that we're doing that maybe we shouldn't. And then what are the things that we're not doing that we should be doing and what are the things that we're not doing that we shouldn't be doing. Sounds so simple. (laughs) But but that was really fun because it was very intellectual. It was think about what where are the areas if you had capital to invest as as an investor, you would want it to be. But then map against that, which of those areas do we think lend themselves to being operated in an increasingly large scale organization? So you might say small, fundamental, value-driven hedge fund might be a good thing to do, but does it need to be, or and can it sustainably be done inside the four walls of a really large asset manager where you're constrained by filing requirements that come from the index business? Yeah. And you might say, you know what, that that's an interesting place to have money, but we probably shouldn't do it here as a major focus. And And in fact, we're better off procuring that exposure for investors through Legacy Quellos, now BlackRock Alternative Advisors, the, the hedge fund to funds business, rather than trying to manufacture it internally. By comparison, like infrastructure seemed really interesting. I didn't know what that meant when I first started investigating it, but parts of infrastructure were really interesting. We focused initially on renewable power. We brought in a great guy named Jim Barry to run the, the business. And that was something you could look at and say, this is something that, you know, these are assets that require broad reach, government relations and connections, long-term financing relationships, and really should be conducted on a large, stable platform and can be sustainably. And so we built out the infrastructure business, which we could then offer to the firm's clients as a substitute for bonds, right? You, you, You trust BlackRock for bonds. These are bonds, but better. Uh, so that was a, a great thing to build. So I enjoyed that. I did miss, you know, with the passage of time investing. The first part of the adventure was kind of like investing because you were choosing which investment capabilities to invest in. As it matured, uh, stabilized, it was more management and less investing. And I was fortunate that one of our major LPs, we developed a, a nice relationship with me and actually trusted us, us with some money. At this point, I was the CIO of the alternatives business. So with effectively a CIO's fund to invest in various ideas that we came across. So what types of things did you invest in? Oh, it was really fun. We did everything from you know, music royalties and rights to we, we did a wireless spectrum deal with Charlie Ergen and uh, Dish Networks, where he was entering the Spectrum auctions for the AWS3 band, back to media and communications roots. And we backed a small business, which entered the auction as a small business eligible for bid discounts. And so uh, there might have been a so little So this higher. is BlackRock and Charlie Ergen. 
as a small business. There were reporters who picked up on that same kind of uh, <laughs> irony. It's actually in litigation still with the FCC because the FCC had a different view of the eligibility as well. So these were investments that we made where relationships were funneling opportunities in. We could evaluate them, structure them, and do the the wireless auction deal, the music rights. We recapitalized a company called Home Partners of America, which is the leading provider of the rent-to-own home financing. You want to go buy a house. You're not going to qualify for a mortgage. No one should really lend to someone who might default because the foreclosure process has been proven to be too expensive. And so the right answer really is a rent-to-own, as with furniture. Rent the house, establish your credit history. You have an option as your credit history improves to purchase the house, the house that you've been living in. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but the breakage for everybody is less. It was a Lou Ranieri idea. And so we we did that deal. So we had all this, you know, these interesting deals that were coming in. I was able to do them. But it reminded me that that's actually what I enjoyed more than managing what was increasingly a stabilizing business. And so the management responsibilities were were larger than the strategic or investing responsibilities. And so I started a series of conversations with Larry about, you know, where my longer term interests and ambitions lie. And Larry was just great about it, very understanding, and suggested that, listen, sort this through with me in a responsible way where we can make transition plans for the businesses and we'll back you in doing this when you leave. I'd have to think that BlackRock is a pretty unique platform to see, oh, you could do a telecom deal with Charlie Ergen. You can, Lou Ranieri's coming and bringing in a mortgage related business. Did you think about trying to just say, like, I just want to invest? Let's create a mega BlackRock Opportunities Fund and I'll just run that. I did think about it and Larry suggested it. And he may have been right. That may have been the ultimately more lucrative, larger scale idea. But for me, It wasn't just about how mega could you make something. It was about the day-to-day of life and control and balance. And along the way in thinking about this, I had started talking to a a friend of mine about initially his advice on what to do. And then ultimately, we started talking about forming a partnership. This is uh, Lee Sachs. And I fell in love with the idea of hanging a shingle and having a small partnership and just controlling our lives. And I think with Larry's backing, we would have had as close to that as would be humanly possible in a firm, the scale and prominence of BlackRock. But there ultimately are constraints on how independent you can be in any big regulated firm. And so I think where we ended up is for us the best place, which is We kept really good ties with BlackRock. They bought a little piece of our firm. The journal reported that they can put $400 million with us to invest. And we share ideas and work closely together. But at the beginning of the day when I wake up, it's Gallatin Point Capital. It's me and Lee and a dozen other people. A lot of people get to this point in time where you're in a seat the visions of wanting to do your own thing or whatever it is. You got to make that transition. How did you go about the process from the initial idea to your exit and have it be so smooth that not only is BlackRock supporting you, but you remain an advisor to BlackRock? How did you make that work? Well, I think a lot of patience and wisdom on Larry's part helped. It is hard to make that work, but you can't do it unless both sides have respect for each other and patience and a willingness to see past the moment of you know, separating towards the end state of having a good partnership. And you know, certainly from my part, I didn't you know, do anything to hold them up or embarrass them, none of which would have been deserved. And they couldn't have been more supportive and wonderful. Not only did they make the investment, but they did nice things like talk to potential investors and say, we think it's a good idea to invest. So things they they certainly didn't have to do. But, you know, I think over the 
span of time as we work together will be you know, very mutually beneficial. It always takes two to tango. So I'm sure that BlackRock had to play ball. I'm also sure there are other people who probably have left BlackRock over the years that haven't had the kind of experience you did. So if you shine the light on yourself and the process you went through, what did you do to make it smooth? One important thing is I wasn't leaving to go to a competitor. Most people who've left are in some way setting up shop or going to work for something that will be a competitor to what the firm does. What I was doing was so different than what most of the bread and butter of BlackRock, that I think it was just naturally a little bit less uh, offensive. Second thing was, it, it was very clear in words and in willingness to leave things on the table, that this was not about money, it wasn't about people, it was about truly a different objective function than what people in the firm wanted for themselves. As you said, if we created the mega fund at BlackRock, made more money. But this was about wanting to be entrepreneurial, wanting to be structuring, creating companies and deals, and being willing to leave money on the table, take time in doing it and doing it correctly, and lend long-term assistance. I think those are all you know, proof points of a decision which is rooted in a different objective function rather than dissatisfaction or disagreement. How long did that process take? It took probably a year to work through internally. And it's been almost exactly two years since. And we talk a lot. Uh, you know, I still sit on investment committees. We have very open pipeline calls with them on our business. We've made investments where they've been advisors. We did a, a student loan purchase trade where we buy a flow of loans and that we used their analytics group, their financial markets advisory group, to do a lot of the credit and prepay analytics and to help us with our first securitization. So I'd like to think what we've done is keep some of the better elements of what could be accomplished being one firm and still enjoy, the, from my perspective, the autonomy advantages of being independent. You had this broad swath of alternatives at BlackRock, right? You talked about infrastructure, hedge funds, private equity, opportunistic investing. As you step back, as you're forming Gallatin Point, there's some objective function of what you want to do. And there's probably something about sort of what's your view of the world at the time. So let's start with the latter. Yeah. As you look at this whole landscape of alternatives investing, what's your perspective today? General markets perspective is things seem expensive, right? So the you know, the risk you're creating in, across a lot of assets buying at at least, you know, a couple of weeks ago's price is, you know, I think skewed negatively. And I've had that view for longer than it's been evidenced. I don't know if it's early or wrong, but to me, the, the implication of that as to how you want to structure your investing activities is to be sort of maximally flexible, particularly given that sectorally, by experience, we're relatively focused in financial services, big universe, but it's not the full world. And so our perspective was that if you're going to be relatively focused in a sector, and if you believe your investment period is likely to include or start with a period that has a lot of risk, what we wanted to have was the ability to invest anywhere in the capital structure. And so rather than being wedded to I am the hammer of control private equity nails. We should be able to do control private equity, minority equity, structured, preferreds, debt, and assets. And look at a situation and say, given where we are in the cycle and valuations, given the nature of the underlying, in this case, I want to be nowhere, or I want to be ring-fenced on these assets, or I want to make this loan, or I want to have this structured piece of of equity. Why don't you walk through some of the things you've done to give examples of that? So we've made uh, four investments, and I think we're about to make a fifth. The first one we made was an investment in the student loan pool. And so we looked at a company which we think is a really innovative. It's a fintech, but it's run by real finance people, credit people, people who come from Sally Mae. 
And so they know what they're doing. They created a very slick online app, phone app, for students who are still in school to take out loans. But the niche they focus on is loans where there are uh, high credit quality parents or grandparents who are willing to co-sign. And that financial support from the co-signer allows them to access credit at a much better rate than if they, as a junior in college, went out and tried to get the loan themselves. So we looked at the business and we think it's a really interesting business, but it's at that point, it was a more venture stage company, the equity of which kind of belonged in the hands of venture capitalists. But we thought the assets which they were producing were really interesting. The average FICO of their loans at the, it was kind of 760, 770, and had some interesting characteristics about non-dischargeability and, and bankruptcy. Low default rates through the crisis for this subset of student loans, and yet they price at, call it LIBOR plus 700. And so we created a structure where we just bought the loans as they made them, and we accumulated them in a warehouse facility and aggregated them to a certain scale and then securitized the loans and took back the resids. And if you looked at that execution relative to going out and trying to buy those same resids, there was a lot of added value to our investors from going through the sausage making process of accumulating and and taking capital markets execution risk, but managing that the best we could. And so we, we thought we clearly created value and you know, achieved or target to achieve rates of return that are, you know, more than what the market would ordinarily pay you and more than what you would absolutely require for taking that kind of credit risk. And so in that case, that's what we did. How do you think about calibrating risk reward on that? So you're a private equity fund. There may be expectations that given an LP illiquidity over time, you need to earn some type of high rate of return. So you may have created these structures of loans that have above market rates for the risk of those loans, but do you then lever them to get a certain type of return profile? Yeah. So first, cl- I would clarify, we, we don't consider ourselves a private equity firm. We would consider ourselves a private investment firm. To us, an important distinction because a private equity firm wouldn't do this, wouldn't make this investment. It doesn't reach their at least their targeted investment return. It's not a company. It doesn't have people who work at it. You couldn't check the VCOC box. So that's an important distinction. For a second, it comes down, I think, to transparency with the investors. So we had very clear conversations about our intended investment strategy with our investors. What is the investment strategy for Gallatin Point? It is to invest across the capital structure, predominantly but not exclusively in the financial services business, with a flexible mandate in partnership with people to bring the right people, the right structures and the right capital to bear to make outsized returns relative to risk. So in this case, we brought the people of College Avenue together with a structure which was a warehouse to a securitization on a flow purchase agreement and the right capital, which is capital that understood that this shouldn't be expected to be a 20% return. We had that open dialogue and said, we're going to do some deals like this. We do think this is a mid-teen return deal. We could be wrong, but it seems to be tracking that way. So we're going to sometimes do things that look like 15s, and sometimes we're going to do things that look like higher that have more risk. And you shouldn't invest in this strategy if all you want is the more equitized exposure. And we were very, very fortunate to have day one investors come to us who bought into that approach. We made an investment with a family, into a family business uh, called the the Hunt family. The, not the oil hunts, not the ketchup hunts, not the trucking hunts, but the real estate hunts in El Paso, who are uh, like a longstanding, outstanding family. They made their fortune in the military housing business and went on to expand their presence in real estate into affordable and market rate multifamily and then on to infrastructure. And we were fortunate to be introduced to them through a member of the family who was on the PennyMac board. And we had a great strategic conversation about 
what they were trying to do, the CEO is Chris Hunt, what he was trying to do and what we were trying to do with people like him. And we ended up forging a partnership where we invested in the business and are uh, helping them, we hope, to vision and execute a move into asset management, bringing third-party capital alongside the family's capital. They're in the property development management, mortgage finance, residential mortgage financing, tax credit syndication, and infrastructure, all these real asset debt and equity businesses. And for those interested, they're also working on an opportunity zone structure, which we've talked about. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, I think the opportunity zone thing, the challenge is going to be finding good deals, not finding capital. And we felt like, and they felt like having tentacles into local developers of lowercase a affordable housing nationally was is an interesting way to access that. And then we did back to White Mountains. It, it all comes back to White Mountains. The White Mountains had bought a Scandinavian reinsurance company in, I want to say, 2004 from ABB, which preceded GE in blowing up as a conglomerate. And they bought this business. They put it together with other reinsurance groups within White Mountains. And then in 2016, sold it to a Singapore-based Chinese-funded investment group and retained the management team who were largely the former White Mountains management team, Alan Waters, Kip Oberting, old friends. And for a variety of reasons, they elected that it was in the interest of the group to go public and to do so on an accelerated time frame. So they elected to do that by merging with a spec, which also happened to be run by an old friend, Avi Kalkstein, uh, who was a former Flowers partner. And so they had this merger set and it became apparent that the merger would be better if there was certainty of a certain amount of capital being in the company at close. And with this generation of SPACs, it's not clear until the very end how much capital is going to arrive with the SPAC. Not only can the shareholders vote, but they can redeem until fairly close to the last minute. And so we knew the company well going back to 2004. We knew the management, we knew the SPAC, we knew the market, and we were able on a you know, pretty short time frame to come up with a way to effectively backstop there being a certain quantum of capital available at the time of close. We, we ended up writing a variable sized convertible preferred with warrant coverage. And so we were willing to put in up and we brought in partners up to $210 million, but the company could reduce that amount to the extent that the SPAC money arrived. So they'd have more common and less of this convertible preferred. And we would get compensated for that with a good security and the warrant coverage, none of which would be good if we didn't actually like the company and the management team. But given that we did, it was it was a nice way for our investors to be compensated for value being delivered into the situation. And what ended up happening on the closing of the SPAC? SPAC ended up closing with very bringing along relatively little of its capital. So our, our full facility ended up being drawn. But we're delighted about that because I do think it's a great company with great management and we have great security. So we're, you know, very pleased about it. So you also sit on the boards or board of hospital investment committee, other nonprofits. And I'm sure you were in front of a lot of big pools of capital in your days, BlackRock and probably some still. What observations do you have about how institutional capital is getting managed today? It's really hard to generalize, right? The the differences that exist between, I hadn't appreciated how profound the differences are that exist between these different types of institutional capital pools that have nothing in common other than they're institutional because they're not individual. So in my travels at BlackRock, I was I would go to China and see you know Safe and CIC. I would go to the Middle East and see ADIA, KIA, all the acronyms. Go to Europe and see the pensions and the endowments and foundations, which tend to be smaller as a presence there, and the private banks. Travel around North America and see insurance companies and life is different than PNC and pensions and state pensions are different from corporate pensions. 
and Canada is totally different than the U.S. and then Bermuda and its insurers. So it, just an incredible array. And I would say, in general, I think many of them are overly siloed and overly valuing of liquidity. If you just said, like, what are the things that stand out as problems? And the ones that manage to reduce or mitigate the silos and allocate, think about illiquidity and allocate it thoughtfully are just, I think, heavily advantaged. And so the flip side of that is the way that most investors, particularly the last five or 10 years, have access to liquidity has been in kind of traditional private equity. So you look at BlackRock today, Blackstone, where you started today, compared to where they were five or 10 years ago in terms of assets. Mm -hmm. There's huge amounts of capital sort of sitting there, maybe chasing the same deals, bidding up prices. Traditional private equity multiples are probably the highest they've been in a long time. So how do you balance the two when you look at investment opportunities? It's a funny thing. First of all, empirically, the private equity industry has delivered a uh, premium. We did these studies at BlackRock, and even you controlled for cap selection, industry focus, leverage adjustments, fees, it still delivered, you know, three to 400 basis points of extra return. And why do you think that's happened? I think it's the attention with which companies are managed, whether it's capital structure optimization or just writing management. The performance is different, and I think those are the reasons. So the answer is, in my view, it's better than not having done it. And is that true even at today's prices? The spreads will vary, right, by vintage. Yeah. And to the extent that you're paying bigger multiples that are more dependent on financing being there for the next buyer, I think you're likely to see it contract. My guess is some of that's already come out of the market as the financing assumptions have started to change. But clearly the magnitude will, will vary. I think, though, the, so some is better than none. One of the questions I think that the industry will have to sort of work through over the next decade is, is this the right form? So having, we see this on the hospital investment committees, you have to make a decision today about whether to allocate to these funds that will draw your capital over the next, could be one year, could be five years, hold the investments for what could be a year, could be another seven years. And you've got to make that commitment today. You should be sitting on the funding to meet those capital calls or have some way that you're going to meet those capital calls. And so there's a frictional loss on that excess liquidity relative to if you invested it some other way. And if the opportunity set shifts that the financial services opportunistic fund that you just committed to sees less opportunity and energy gets cheap, it's too late because you've made that commitment. And then you hold it unless and until it matures or you hit a secondary bid, which sometimes is frothy and usually is not. So it's a really inefficient way to deploy in a liquidity budget you know, if you had another alternative. Having said that, I'd be pretty critical of some of the efforts to try to internalize and do it directly. Not that the people who are doing it aren't great, but... If you look at Blackstone, I don't know how many people they have in the private equity department today. It was 40 when I started. I bet it's 150 today. You see some family offices, for example, trying to do it with two people. And I think it's kind of unrealistic to think, no matter how good those two people are, that they're going to be able to manage a portfolio, uh, source, finance, oversee a portfolio in the manner that a Blackstone can. So I think one poll is inefficient. This, you know, let's silo and lock up capital with no transparency or liquidity for who knows how long. But I don't think the other one's right either of, I'm just going to do it myself. When I'm sick, I go see a, a doctor at a hospital. I don't try to. So the question I think is going to be, what's the middle position? How do you get the benefits of a good illiquid investment program without some of the drawbacks. The Canadians were really big developers of this. You know, one answer is you just commit and you have a co-investment program and you use it and you manage down your costs and you manage up your flexibility. There's some more radical things out there. I'm involved with a 
company called Cadre on the real estate side, which is a very innovative fintechy, but but with real real estate people like uh, Facitelli involved, and it lets you make individual investment and sale decisions on institutional quality real estate investments. So I think we'll see more innovation. I think from a starting point of, I just build a PE fund portfolio through, you know, I mix direct and indirect to technology enabled platforms that let you make more kind of real time course adjustments based on what is happening in the markets and what is happening at home. And I think we'll continue to see that. And if you had to guess what the optimal structures look like 10 years from now? I think for smaller institutions and high net worth, we always have funds. I think for the biggest institutions, you'll see more separate and managed account platforms, that those will gain share because they give just so much more control, control and transparency to investors. I think at the big end, you'll clearly see that. But you may see it, you know, something like Cadre shows, you may see it come bubble up from the smaller size too, if quality can be maintained. We haven't really talked about the hedge fund side because you're certainly spending all your time in private equity now, but for years, BlackRock and Highfields, you were involved. It hasn't been the rosiest time for hedge funds. Any thoughts? I'm not the world expert on hedge funds. I do think it's interesting to think about what are some of the downstream consequences of the rise of index investing and the decline of active investing? And if you think about some of the opportunities that used to exist if you were a hedge fund, there would be some news event in a, coming out of a company. The market would misunderstand it, which meant the mutual funds would sell on the news. You would have a different view You'd buy it and, you know, you might hedge, you know, correlated to the other members of the industry, and then you would wait for it to recover, right? For that misunderstanding to be corrected. So in the extreme, if you had a hundred percent indexation, there would be no sales on that corporate news event and nothing to buy. What if you're halfway there? If you're halfway there, there's half as many shares being sold into that news event than there used to be. Or like way more cynically, there's fewer dumb decisions being made in one part of the world that can be profited on from the other. And at the same time, there's more money in the hedge fund industry, not compared to last year, but compared to when a lot of investors were making their returns. So in the fundamental value-driven part of the world, I just think it's harder to pick up those misvalued securities. As you move a little off the, the run into distressed and credit-related investments, there's a lot more money going after those. And just because of where we are in the cycle, a lot less of them. So that supply and demand thing, I think, should point to you're going to expect lower returns. And then in some of the quant strategies, there's just a lot more competition too. If you were playing merger arbor, if you're playing yield curve, if you're playing carry trades, there's really cheap ways to implement that and lots of people are doing it. So I think a lot of that easy money has come out. Having said that, there's still people who really do it well, right? So there's still, if you're a Rentec, Two Sigma, they, they still do it. They've invested massively in furthering their information advantage and there's still people like Baplos to do it well. So if you're really smart, if you're really differentiated, if you either are just hiring the best, you know, qualitative people, or if you're investing, Two Sigma has, I think, over a thousand people. So I think there are still opportunities, but it's they're harder to find and they have to be invested in in order to deliver. What do you do with your personal money? Oh, I'm no great model for that. <laughs> <laughs> I have it in our program. Sure. I keep the liquidity in you know, bills and mass geos, right? So just simple liquid stuff. And then I am a believer in real assets. I think as a person, you're ultimately trying to lock in your and your family's ability to purchase. And so if you kind of break that up into what it is you're planning on purchasing, a lot of it can be mapped to a real asset portfolio. So we have 
commercial and residential real estate holdings, multifamily farms that grow different things that feed in. We have uh, some investments in wind farms and uh, solar, which are you know, ultimately tied to the long-term power price. So to the extent that you think over time, you're consuming leisure, you're consuming food, you're consuming energy, trying to own those basic factors of production feels like a good thing to be doing. And then the usual alternative investment assets. Not a lot of uh, public stocks. Not a lot of public stocks. Okay. No index funds? BlackRock index funds? No comment. (laughs) (laughs) But if I were going to buy an index fund, I would buy a BlackRock index fund. There you go. All right, Matt, let's turn to a couple of closing questions. What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? I am a terrible hobby person. I like work. And then my family is the biggest hobby. You know, we have two pretty young kids and I like hanging out with them. I like my wife. So I at one point briefly belonged to a golf club and realized that I literally never went to play golf because I wasn't going to leave Sue and the kids on a Saturday to go play golf. And I was really naturally, like natively, truly lousy at golf. So I I enjoy tennis. You know, I'll I'll take one of the kids and go play tennis. What's your biggest pet peeve? Ignorance is pretty annoying. Ignorance married with arrogance, unbelievably annoying. How about your biggest investment pet peeve? Biggest investment pet peeve? Arbitrary rules. People who set up an arbitrary rule that says, you know, I used to encounter at BlackRock, we met a pension fund that had come to us for permission to basically hypothecate their entire our portfolio to Deutsche so that they could get an, an intraday liquidity facility because their board wanted them to be intraday liquid. It's a pension fund that's going to go and burn 50 basis points a year, their pensionees return, because the board has set up some random rule which says thou shalt be intraday liquid. Yeah, that's a good one. What reading do you almost never miss? I always read the journal every morning pretty much cover to cover. And I still do it physically because I I haven't figured out how to do it on the iPad in a way that allows you to stumble into the accidental story that you wouldn't have otherwise gone to read. I I do have a thing for uh, spy novels. So whenever uh, Daniel Silva has a new book out, I'm pretty quick to get it. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? My father was a great writer and I have a lot of memories of childhood sitting on a, like an ottoman uh, next to him and, and marking up pretty brutally my papers. But he was a big believer in good writing and clear communication, organized thought, good grammar. That's stuck with me. And my mom was always one who, who still, still emphasizes empathy and understanding what the other person is trying to say, even if they're not saying it. All right. Last one. What is your favorite fundamental principle about life? It's the no asshole rule. It's in your friends, in your business dealings, just you can never be compensated enough either through, you know, a fun trip or a great return for dealing with people who aren't good people. Matt, thanks so much. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. 